And so in October, um, Google Ma Maps launched this update to a select number of iPhone users. Now what this update to Google Maps did was that when you went in to calculate directions between two locations, it wouldn't just show you, okay, it'll take you 12 minutes to drive there and 32 minutes to walk there. What it started doing was also showing you the number of calories that it thought that you might burn if you walked instead of taking another form of transit. And it didn't just show you the calories that you might burn, it also would measure those calories in terms of mini cupcakes. So what it would say to you is, this walk burns around 82 calories. That's almost one mini cupcake. So this update goes live. And pretty quickly, some people started asking some questions. My favorite was a journalist named Taylor Lawrence, and she said, first and foremost, she said, oh my god, as she found that this was happening. Oh my god, what is going on? And as she starts going through this, she's on Twitter, and it's about 8 o'clock PM, the day that this launched to her phone. Over the course of the next hour or so, she started walking through all of the reasons that this was a problem. She talked about how there's no way to turn this feature off. She talked about how it could be really triggering for somebody who has had an eating disorder. She talked about how it just felt really shamey. She goes on and on and on about like, why are we even using mini cupcakes as this unit of measurement? She continues on in this conversation until about 9 o'clock PM. Here's the recap of all of the potential flaws that she finds. She says, OK, you can't turn it off. Like, not only can you not opt into it, like, it's not asking you first before adding this. It adds it automatically, and there's no way to turn it off. Um, this is dangerous for people with eating disorders. It just generally feels shamey. Average calorie counts aren't that meaningful. Um, not all calories are created equal. Um, a cupcake is a weird unit of measurement. And then also, cupcakes are not a culturally neutral food. So this is not her exact terminology. This is my terminology. But she talks about how uh, pink cupcakes are a very feminine food, and they're also kind of uh, affiliated with white people and with middle class people. So it's, it's not neutral to talk about mini cupcakes. And then that this perpetuates diet culture. Now, it took her an hour to document all of this. One hour on Twitter documenting this. Within three hours, Google had actually turned this feature off. So I look at that and I think, how much time did they spend on the mini cupcake feature? Now, I work in tech, and um, I've worked on many projects where we're adding a new feature to a product. And I will tell you that they spent more than three hours in a meeting room deciding what the mini cupcake should look like. Like, they spent probably an hour discussing the, how the sprinkles were going to look on that cupcake. But nowhere along the way did they discuss the people for whom this product wouldn't work, or the ways that this might be a problem. And you can, at an individual level, agree or disagree with any of her criticism. Some of those things that she mentions might not be meaningful to you at all. You might think it's great to have calorie counts show up in your Google Maps. You might think that it's fun to have a cupcake. But the reality is, for a lot of people, this might not actually work that well. And either it never came up in that entire design and development process, or it came up and the person who had that criticism was ignored. They weren't listened to in the room. These are the kinds of things that I see left and right in tech. And many of them are kind of small at the surface level. They seem kind of fun and silly, like the cupcakes. But I think that they're indicative of the sort of mundane but harmful things that technology does to us every day. And there's kind of this tech knows best paternalism that we see, where it's like, oh, your phone, this app, is going to know what's right for you. It's going to know that when you want to map something, what you actually want is health advice from your phone. And I think that it's indicative of this tech industry that's become pretty hell-bent on keeping you kind of clicking and tapping along. In tech, we call this engagement. And it's oftentimes like the number one term that comes up in any conversation is, well, what will this do to engagement? What if people don't engage as much with our product? And so when that happens, I think that we get a lot of tech companies that have become very, very blind to the real impact that their work has on people. And it's also made them very narrow in their thinking of who and what is normal. And I think this leads to a lot of problems. So when we talk about normal people um, in tech, that often means leaving out a lot of folks. This is an example of an email my friend Dan Hahn got from his scale, which is like a very 2017 thing to think about. But he gets this email from his scale, the smart scale from Withings. And this email is actually not for Dan. This email is addressed to Calvin. Your hard work will pay off, Calvin. Don't be discouraged by last week's results. 
we believe in you. And then I want him to set a weight goal to shed those extra pounds. Now, Calvin is Dan's toddler. Every week he weighs more. Yeah, every week he weighs more, he's a toddler. Like, that's good. Um, he weighs 29.2 pounds. Like, come on. He doesn't need to go on a diet, right? But that's the only thing that that system understands. So the people who made this product, they sat down, they made a scale, they made a whole system of email notifications, they programmed all of this content in, and along the way it never occurred to them that there were people who would be weighing themselves for reasons that are not wanting to lose weight. And it's pretty funny if you get an email for your toddler about setting a weight goal, but it's a lot less funny in other circumstances. In fact, Dan got this too. This is a push notification. It was actually meant for his wife. Um, Congratulations, you've hit a new low weight. Now, this notification came actually just after she'd had a baby, which, I mean, congratulations, but I don't think this is really what they had in mind. And the thing is, again, it's a little bit funny. She just had a baby, but it gets a lot less funny if you think about somebody who is suffering from a chronic illness or somebody who's suffering from an eating disorder. I have friends who have chronic illnesses where keeping weight on is actually really hard for them. And when they have a new low weight, that is not something to celebrate. That's actually a sign that they're getting sick. That's a sign that there's something really wrong. I also know people who have had eating disorder treatment, and I bet some of you do too, where they spend a long time trying to hit new low weights or trying to count all of their calories, right? And what they have to avoid in order to get better is they have to avoid things like this. They don't want to be congratulated for that because they know that being congratulated about their weight is really bad for them. And again, you can make it all the way through the design and development process for this product and never really think about that. My friend Erin Abler got this one from Etsy. So she has the Etsy app installed on her phone, and this is the push notification that it sends her. So right to her home screen. Move over, Cupid. We've got what he wants. Shop Valentine's Day gifts for him. Erin's partner is a woman. And she read that, and she thought, did, you, did it never occur to you that you have gay users? Like, seriously. Like, did this never, like, this never came up? Nobody thought about it? And it's a small thing. She can still use the app. She can still shop on that app for her partner if she chooses to. But she reads that and she's just a little alienated and she feels a little left out and she feels a little like, really? Now, today, 2017, you've forgotten about gay people? If you've forgotten about gay people in your push notifications, where else have you embedded bias in your product? And then sometimes I see these examples that are a lot more painful and potentially really harmful. So last year, there was a study that came out in JAMA Internal Medicine, so that's the Journal of the American Medical Association's Internal Medicine Journal. And in that study, they showed that uh, smartphone assistants from a lot of different manufacturers, so Siri from Apple, but also Cortana, also um, Microsoft's Cortana, and then Samsung's as well, none of them were designed to help people during crisis. So when people asked things that were related to medical emergencies or crisis moments, they didn't have a response. Oftentimes they didn't even know things like, you know, having a heart attack. But they were particularly bad when it came to things like sexual assault or domestic violence. So if you said to your phone something like, you know, my husband is hitting me, it would just have no idea what was going on. And so I tested this out with a few different examples. And what you would get with Siri on my phone was sometimes just, some, just a response that says, I don't know what this is and no effort to help you. But other times, what I think is a lot worse is you would get Siri actually telling you a joke, right? Kind of poking fun at you asking the question in the first place. One can't know everything, can one? And you know, when I started talking about this, um, I had some people say things to me like, yeah, but who would use their smartphone if they're in a crisis? Like, who is going to their smartphone assistant? Anybody who does that is stupid. And you can think that. But the reality is that people do use their smartphone this way. And one of the things that came out of the study is that they, they talked a lot about how for younger people, for teens and tweens, oftentimes they're more comfortable going to their technology than they are going to a person. And so you can think it's stupid that somebody might say, like, I was sexually assaulted and I don't know what to do to their smartphone assistant. But the reality is that humans are doing that. And tech companies aren't necessarily paying attention to that and designing for that. The other interesting thing about this is that 
Apple specifically should not have been surprised because back in 2011, when Siri was brand new, they actually got a lot of bad press for um, an issue where if you said to your phone that you wanted to shoot yourself, it would give you directions to a gun store. And after they got that bad press, they apologized, of course. Oh my gosh, we did not anticipate that this would happen. We did not intend for the technology to work this way. So they partnered with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And what they started doing was that if you um, said something that it indicated might be suicidal, they would surface a little note that said like, hey, if you'd like to talk to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, we'll connect you and you could kind of do a one tap to connect. So that was 2011. So here we are, this is from 2016, five years later, and Apple knew that it had a problem during crisis, but it didn't bother to fix it across the board. They only fixed that one thing. They didn't say, hmm, I wonder if people are gonna use this product in ways we hadn't originally thought about. I wonder if maybe the jokes and the humor are not working. I wonder if this is actually working for real life. Perhaps the, the best known example of these kinds of problems that I see in interfaces all the time happened to my friend Eric Meyer. It happened to him a couple years ago and actually led him and I writing a, a little book together called Design for Real Life. And it was targeted at people who are in the tech industry specifically. And in that book, um, or in that, in that example, what happened to him is that he went on Facebook on Christmas Eve of 2014. And he was expecting the typical stuff you would see on Christmas Eve, which would be things like updates from family, photos of people with the tree, that kind of thing. Instead, what he got was an advertisement from Facebook for something called Year in Review. So what Year in Review does, um, and they've done it every year since, is it creates a little album of your highlights from the year. So it'll take your most popular photos, videos, posts, pull them all together, package them up for you, and then present it back to you and say, here's what your year looked like. And then what they want you to do, of course, is share these with your friends, because the more you share this with your friends, the more engagement Facebook has, the more ads they sell. So Facebook surfaces up to his feed, and what they have on the cover here is a little design of Facebook's making with people dancing at a party and balloons and streamers. And in the center of it is a picture of Eric's daughter, Rebecca. This is the most popular photo that he posted all year because it was the most commented on. It was the most commented on because Rebecca had died of an aggressive brain cancer that summer. This was the worst year of Eric's life. This was a year that he never wanted to relive. But there it was, pushed to the top of his feed, without him asking for it, without him opting into it. And it broke his heart. He's still in the middle of grief, he's still processing what's happened to him. And there is this thing that he never wanted to surface and share with his friends, and he certainly didn't want to see surrounded by all these smiling, happy people at a party. And Facebook hadn't really thought about it. They hadn't thought about what could go wrong. So this story actually blew up, like these things tend to do, and all of a sudden he's on Slate and he's on NPR, et cetera, et cetera, and Facebook apologized. Um, the product manager who ran this project uh, felt really bad about it. And in fact, a friend of mine um, was a content strategist at Facebook at the time, and she was assigned to this product. And she told me that, you know, she remembers it running by her desk, um, but it was the end of the year, she was on a lot of different projects, she remembers there was some conversation about what might happen if people had a bad year, but she didn't follow up on it. And as often happens, you know, we got a lot going on. It went out the door. So they felt bad about this. But here's the thing. Just recently, they've done basically the same thing, slightly different context. So this is an ad for Instagram that was surfaced on people's Facebook feeds. So how this works is that Facebook owns both Instagram and Facebook, right? So um, Facebook would like more of its users to also use Instagram. So what it will do is it will go to, if you use Instagram, it will go to your Facebook friends' pages and put an ad for Instagram on their page and show them your Instagram photos. So it's effectively like, wouldn't it be cool if you used Instagram too? Look what you're missing out on. Only the photo that it surfaced was from a journalist's Instagram account where she had posted a screenshot of a rape threat that she received. She posted it because she wanted people to know the kind of abuse that women often get online when they have public lives. And of course, 
she got a lot of comments on this post. So a lot of people saw this Instagram post and commented on it, and Facebook thought, oh, great, this must be a really popular photo. So they took this graphic rape threat, wrapped it up in a peppy Facebook ad, and put it on her friends' feeds. So again, over and over, they make the same kinds of errors, where they're thinking that something that's popular is something that needs to be relived, or thinking that they understand enough about their users to be able to pull content out of context and put it in their own context. I think about all of these little interface examples, and I, I'm always reminded of this uh, tweet from Zainab Tefeki um, a couple of weeks ago. She is a techno-sociologist. She's wonderful. Um, check her out if you're not familiar with her. And she said, you know, Silicon Valley is run by people who want to be in the tech business, but they're in the people business, and they're in way over their heads. And we're starting to see that at play in some areas that are getting more and more dangerous and more and more worrisome. One of my favorite places to look at things like bias in, in tech is in things like photo filters and photo apps. This is um, a snap from Snapchat that uh, a woman named Grace took last year. She was using a filter that was called anime. Now, I don't know if you've watched any anime, but this doesn't really look like anime. What this looks like is a caricature. In fact, it looks to me a lot like uh, Mickey Rooney, who was playing uh, Iwayu Niyoshi in Breakfast at Tiffany's, which today we would call yellow face. And we would say, you know what, don't do that. You don't wear somebody's race as a costume. But that's effectively what Snapchat did, is they took her selfie and they morphed it to have buck teeth and slanty eyes, and they turned it into this comical caricature of an Asian person, not into an anime figure. And so Snapchat was really called out for this, and a lot of people said they were going to boycott the product, but Snapchat kind of wouldn't apologize. They just said, well, we're just, we're just not going to use that filter again. And the thing is, it wasn't just that one time that Snapchat made a decision like this, because a few months before, on April 20th, 420, um, they launched this filter called Bob Marley. What the Bob Marley filter did was darken your skin and give you dreadlocks. So pretty quickly, people were like, whoa, 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 that's, that's blackface. Which I think probably like at this point in college, you've all heard, right? Like you don't go to a party dressed up as a black person. Um, you don't paint your face black. Like that's a racist trope, and we don't do that, usually. When it happens, that makes the news. But here we have a tech company who's effectively giving you blackface in a selfie that you're going to share with your friends. And again, Snapchat didn't want to apologize for it. So both of those things happened last year. And you would think that these companies would kind of learn from one another and recognize these problems. But here this year, we had a new app come out that got really popular for a little while called FaceApp. Some of you probably used it. It was one of these face morphing filters. And with FaceApp, you could make yourself like an older version of yourself or a younger version of yourself or a hotter version of yourself. And what a lot of users found is that the hotness filter, which is literally what it was called, would do things like lighten their skin, narrow the bridge of their nose, give them more traditionally European features. Now, when users kind of called them out for this and said, like, wait a second, this is making people whiter, FaceApp actually admitted that that was a problem. This is what their CEO said. He said, we're deeply sorry for this unquestionably serious issue. It's an unfortunate side effect of the underlying neural network caused by the training set bias, not intended behavior. So I'm going to explain what this means. When he says that it's an unfortunate side effect and that it is not intended behavior, what he means is that we didn't mean to do something racist. But when he talks about the underlying neural network, what he means, what he literally means, is that they took a huge number of photos of people who were hot, whatever that means, right? They figured out what traits they wanted to identify as being attractive. They took a large number of photos of attractive people, fed them to the system, and from that, this, this algorithm went through and learned, OK, this is what hotness looks like. And then it used that information about what hotness looks like to then make tweaks to your selfie. The training set data, all of the images that that system was fed, were pictures of white people. So if you feed a system a bunch of pictures of white people and tell it this is what beauty looks like, then it's going to learn a biased sense of what beauty is. 
And we're seeing this over and over in lots of different ways, where training set data, so that the, the data that a system is fed to learn something, has underlying bias to it that nobody's talking about. And you would think that FaceApp would learn, because they didn't want to see this happen, they, it's not intended behavior. But actually, just in August, they released this new filter that's literally a race filter, where you could go in and you could try yourself on like a, uh, let's see, black, Caucasian, Asian, and Indian filter. Very quickly, people were upset about this. And so again, of course, they apologized. The new controversial features will be removed in the next few hours. When I look at something like this, I think one of the big problems is that tech companies will write something off as controversial. It's not just tech, you see this all the time, right? It's like, well, there was some disagreement. When you call something like this controversial, you're kind of inviting this like, well, you gotta hear both sides. Some people think racism is fine, some people think it's not fine. It kind of puts everything on this level playing field. And the thing is, what that doesn't do is that doesn't acknowledge history. Like there's a tremendous amount of history. There's tons of people who have researched like critical race theory for decades. This is not some like wild new field that nobody knows anything about. It's just that tech companies have been playing fast and loose with people's emotions and with people's identities, and they haven't really consulted any of that history or engaged with it. And so it reduces it to this disagreement instead of dealing with it as it actually is. And the other thing is that this is just not news because um, AI has been used to um, understand what's in images and tag images and edit images for a few years now. And back in 2015, Google Images had this particular problem. What Google Images did is it would go through all of your photos and it would auto tag them. And we're seeing this come up more and more in, in other photo apps as well. Like if you go through your photos on an iPhone, you can now find them according to how they've been auto tagged. What auto tagging does is it, it basically, it's the same thing as I mentioned with um, the neural network for learning what hotness is. The neural network needs to learn about what these photos are of, right? So like you feed it, thousands of pictures of cats, and then it knows, oh, okay, that's what a cat looks like. And then you show it a new picture of a cat, and it goes, cat. And that's how it can auto-tag your photos. So it does the same thing with all kinds of objects, skyscrapers, airplanes, cars, etc. But what it also did is auto-tag pictures of black people, a whole series of pictures of these two black people, as gorillas. Now, it was every single photo that they took that day, all the different poses that they had, were all tagged in their system as gorillas. So when this came out, this made a lot of press as well. It's pretty common, right? Like you see this stuff, it flashes by on social media, it picks up steam, suddenly you have major media calling uh, the person this happened to, a guy named Jackie Elsine, and everybody freaks out. And the reason they freaked out is that the word gorilla is a racial slur. However, the really interesting thing about this is not as much about the fact that it happened to mistag them as gorillas. That was like a weird circumstance. What I think is really interesting about this is why that happened. So Jonathan Zunger used to work at Google and he um, was one of the lead technical folks on this project. And after this happened, he tweeted to Jackie Elsine, the guy who this had happened to, that they were gonna work on fixing it. He said, we're also working on longer term fixes around both linguistics, words to be careful about in photos of people. So they were gonna make a list of words that could have sensitive meanings if they were misapplied. But also, image recognition itself, e.g. better recognition of dark skinned faces. What that means is that they released a product that was better at identifying light skinned faces than dark skinned faces. Like Google Photos, was comfortable sending their tagging product out to the market, out to all of you who have ever used a Google product, knowing, or at least being able to identify very quickly, that it wasn't as good with dark-skinned people as it was with light-skinned people. Now, why does that happen? Well, the thing is, failing to, identify, or failing to design for black people is actually not new. Um, it's been going back quite some time. So back in the 50s, Kodak, started offering um, uh, these kits that they would send out to photo lab technicians. Because it used to be you'd have to take your film to Kodak to get it developed. Then you could take it to a mom and pop. So they wanted to send these mom and pops some guidance to help them develop film correctly. So they started sending these things called Shirley cards. This is one of them from a little later. 
And Shirley cards were designed to help the technicians calibrate light and shadow and things like that effectively. And so they were named for this woman, Shirley, who sat for the first one, who was a Kodak employee. And for years, for decades, they sent these out and they were always the same. The woman would change, the styling of her outfit might change, but it was always a woman, she was always labeled as normal, and she was always white. And so as a result of that, you had for years film that didn't effectively capture darker skin tones. Um, a black photographer, Sarita McFadden, she wrote about this and she said, you know, when a, light, a white body is your light meter, every other skin tone becomes a deviation from the norm. It turns out that film stock's failures to capture dark skin aren't a technical issue, they are a choice. So it's a choice that the company made that it wasn't important enough for them to make sure that this could be done well. And in fact, it wasn't until the late 70s that Kodak started to change this, and the reason that they started to get better with their film product, developing on dark skin tones, was not because they wanted to include more people. It was because chocolate manufacturers and furniture makers had been complaining to them that when they were photographing their products, you couldn't tell enough of a difference between, say, dark and milk chocolate or different grains of wood. That is what actually got them to improve that product. Now, I look at all of these examples and I think there's no other way to say it, but like, this is literally what white supremacy is. When we talk about white supremacy, I think we often talk about like, people marching, angry, violent neo-Nazis. But what do the words white supremacy mean? Well, it means putting white people on top, right? It's saying, oh, it's more important to design this to work for white people than for other people. Or it's okay if this product goes out the door working better for white people than for other people. And these happen over and over again in all of these tiny ways. And those ways sometimes add up to some really big but invisible ways. Here on your left is Bernard Parker, and then on your right is Dylan Fugit. So Bernard was arrested in 2013 in Broward County, Florida. He was 23 years old, and he possessed marijuana. Dylan was arrested in the same place about a month later. He was 24, and he possessed cocaine. Now, both of these men had a prior record. Um, we had Bernard had been arrested before for resisting arrest without violence and Dylan had attempted robbery. So both men had a prior record. Both men were arrested in the same place around the same time for very similar crimes. But according to software called Compass, which is this correctional offender management profiling for alternative sanctions made by a private company called North Point, these men don't have a similar profile at all. So Bernard was rated a 10, which is the highest risk there is for recidivism. So you are more likely to commit a future crime is what that score says. Well, uh, Dylan only was rated a three. Now actually, Dylan's gone on to um, be arrested three more times, and Bernard has not been arrested again at all. And according to ProPublica, which did this major investigation into this last year, this is incredibly common. In fact, they found that um, the, the scores were remarkably unreliable, particularly for violent crime, that only 20% of the people who were predicted to commit a violent crime went on to do so. And, it's not just that the scores were unreliable, it's also the way that the system got it wrong that's really telling. You see, like we saw with that one example with Bernard and Dylan, what you would have over and over again was a similar story. You would have black people would be much more likely, 45% of the time, to be labeled high risk, but then not commit a future offense. So they were told they were high risk, and then in the future they did not commit another crime. Meanwhile, the software would routinely label white people as low risk, and then they would go and reoffend. So you see, the system got it wrong for everybody, but there was one group that was shouldering the burden of that wrongness. There was one group where if it got it wrong, it was got, getting it wrong in a way that would hurt them. And this was happening over and over and over again, because this software isn't just used in Florida, it's used in hundreds of state and local municipalities across the country. So these are algorithmically determined scores that are used to do things like set bond amounts, and in a bunch of states, they actually are used to decide how long your sentence can be. So one of the reasons that these disparities exist is that the algorithm was tuned to be fair, quote unquote fair, according to the company. 
The way that they defined fairness was to say that if a person of one racial group and another racial group both were given the same score, like a seven, they had the same chances of committing a future crime. So at a seven, black people and white people both had about a 60% chance of committing another crime, and they said that's what fairness means. But the problem is that you have an overall baseline rate of, um, of scores that's higher for black people because there's more, more likelihood that a black defendant is gonna have a criminal history, and also some other reasons I'm gonna get to in a second. And because the average score for a black person is higher, it means that mathematically you cannot have fairness in terms of um, sevens getting the same treatment and fairness in terms of who takes on the burden for wrong scores. You mathematically cannot do that. The algorithm cannot function that way. And so the, the concept of fairness and what it meant to be fair hadn't really been fully developed. And so it's not just that there's a higher uh, baseline arrest rate for, for um, black people than there is for white people, which has a tremendous amount of history in this country. Um, if you look at how mass incarceration has worked, um, there's a lot to talk about there. But there's also these other factors. So Compass uses 167 different factors to decide what your score should be. These are things where if you were arrested, you would be asked a lot of different questions, and they'd write down all the answers to those, and that's what would figure out your score. So some of those questions are things like, is there much crime in your neighborhood? Were you bored often? Have you moved around a lot? Do you have a family member who was ever in jail? And so none of these questions are neutral. These questions have everything to do with where you grew up and how much money you had. And so if you grew up in an urban environment, and if you grew up black in the United States, where we've been incarcerating black men at an extremely high rate for decades, your odds of answering yes to a lot of these questions go way up, regardless of anything else about you and your particular circumstances and your particular psyche and your particular interest in committing crimes. This is what happens when we assume that things that are meant to be technical are also neutral. This is what happens when we say, well, the software gave the answer. He's a 10, he's a three, it's a number, it's the computer, humans weren't involved, it must be right. But as you can see, there's nothing neutral about those questions, there's nothing neutral about that entire process. It's all layered with so much history and context and culture. And so when you try to outsource all of that to a computer program, what you don't actually do is eliminate bias. What you do is you just outsource that bias. You make it not your problem. So it's easier as a person to say, well, I didn't do anything biased, but it doesn't change the harms that come out of it. And we can see stuff like this happening over and over in tech. For example, there's software called word to vec um, What it does is it took three million words from Google News articles, so Google engineers built this. And so it took three million words from this huge corpus of Google News articles. From that corpus of Google News articles, they did the same kinds of stuff we talked about with image recognition, right? So they took that and they, they had the algorithm parse through all that language and look for relationships between words. What the system learned is how to answer analogies. So it would answer analogies like um, king is to queen as man is to blank correctly, or Tokyo is to Japan as Paris is to France. It could fill those things out. But it would also come back with other analogies like Man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. This is true according to the data it was fed, right? Like it was fed all these Google News articles and it looked at how the words sit in those articles. So it finds that words that, are, that it knows are more feminine tend to be written in these ways and these ones are this ways. And so it was able to be like, oh yeah, okay. The way the word homemaker functions in this corpus of text is very similar to the way that computer programmer functions when it comes to men. But it's not true in the same way that like Paris is to France as Tokyo is to Japan. It did the best it could do with the data that it was fed. And so you have to look at that data and you have to say, okay, well, if you feed it a bunch of Google News articles, that means basically you feed it media stories from all kinds of different publications, then you have to know that it's going to reflect what's in those articles. What's in those articles is going to reflect culture, it's going to reflect society, and it's going to reflect the biases of the people who wrote them. 
But what happens is that tech is not necessarily used to thinking about that in advance. And so this kind of technology actually ends up being used in other things. So you take something like this and it becomes a tool that's added to natural language processing software. And then that software gets used to build other software like um, let's say a chat bot that's going to respond to inquiries from a company or tons of other tools. One of the scariest places that this is going is that they're starting to use this kind of natural language processing in things like hiring and recruitment. And so if you have a system, a piece of software that's supposed to automatically read resumes and identify who's a good fit for a job, and that software is built on this kind of natural language processing technology, it could have biases embedded in that software that you don't even realize, that you would never notice. You also have things like this. This is called Coco. Uh, it's a, an image library that was more than 1,000 images from the web, so all of these images from the web that were labeled. What Coco learned in a similar process after looking at thousands of images was that when it saw a picture of kitchen implements, that it should tag those pictures with the word women. And it learned that because the images that it learned from tended to show women in relationship to stuff that was in kitchens more often. And that's just like a true thing, that if you look at all of the images that are uploaded to the internet, they will show things like that. They will, you will be more likely to find women in kitchens. You'll be more likely to find like white guys sitting around a conference table. There are more of those images. And so what happens though is that this software ends up taking that stuff that exists in the world as if it is just truth. It doesn't know, it doesn't know any different, right? It doesn't know that there's a difference between the word homemaker and an analogy about like Paris and Tokyo. It doesn't know that unless we teach it that. And that's the problem. When we talk about AI right now, and this is Fei-Fei Li, she, um, she leads the Stanford Vision Lab, and she's on a sabbatical right now, actually, to run um, AI at Google Cloud. And I'm, I'm really excited about her work because this stuff is really important to her. She also runs a foundation that's designed to get more diverse people into AI because she says the problem is AI is really task-focused. What it doesn't have is contextual awareness. It lacks the kind of flexible learning that humans have. And if we want to make technology that makes humans' lives better, and that makes our world safer, then we need a layer of human-level communication and collaboration. This is not what the tech companies are used to saying. They're used to calling all of this work purely technical work, that it's all about just having engineers who can move fast and break things and come out the other end with an algorithm that works most of the time. And as you can see, that breaks over and over again. And it's not just on the technology side, it's also on the design side and sort of the communication side. Because what we often find is that the way that we design things, the way things are positioned, we can make our biases look like facts. So with Compass, for example, um, they specifically say in their literature when they're trying to sell you the product that it's designed to be user-friendly even for those with limited computer experience and education. So that makes sense. In software, this is often a goal. You want things to be user-friendly. You want it to make sense for people even if they're not used to using computers all the time. You want things to be easy to use and intuitive and seamless. But when you want to have that goal and you don't also think about, well, okay, does that make it seem simple? Does it make it seem inevitable that the numbers are just facts for something that is obviously much more complicated than that? What kind of problems does that cause? And this is true in lots of design decisions. Um, there is a scholar at the University of Alabama, Miriam Sweeney, where she, she talks a lot about how search results work. Search results, if you look at something like Google, right, they're very simple, they're very clean. And that sparse design, she says, works to obscure the complexity of the interface, making the result appear purely scientific and data-driven. Google has said this. They want you to think that their search is scientific and data-driven. The insistence of scientific truth of algorithmic search has encouraged users to view search as an objective and neutral experience. And I think most of us do. Like, we, we kind of trust Google search, at least reasonably. Sometimes it comes up with stuff that isn't what you wanted. But you're thinking, like, yeah, no, their, their whole system is designed to understand what you want and to give you the best information that it can find. And it is. They, they work very hard at that. But it makes it easy to forget that it's actually a bunch of machines that were designed by people and that those people have all kinds of biases. And all of that is made invisible by this design that's clean and simple and seems so obvious. In the tech industry, um, we talk a lot about disruption. We're going to disrupt this industry or that industry. 
So far, it hasn't gone great. Um, we've disrupted media pretty effectively. Uh, here we are looking at tons of fake news. We've disrupted taxis effectively. And here we are with Uber drivers sleeping in their cars. Um, but disruption, that's supposed to be the goal. And I think about this a lot when I look at what's happened over the past year or so, um, before, during, and after the election. So back in 2014, Facebook um, was really upset because Steve Ferguson was happening. Black Lives Matter was springing up. And on Twitter, that's what the entire conversation was about. On Facebook, that was completely absent from their trending topics, which they had just launched that year. Everybody was doing the ice bucket challenge. And in fact, what a lot of people argued was that, um, actually, we were talking about Ferguson and Black Lives Matter on Facebook, but it wasn't being surfaced. The algorithm wasn't picking it up. And so Facebook was really upset about this because they really, at the time, were trying to make a major play for being a source for news for people. Even though they don't want to be seen as a media company, they do want to be seen as a source for news. And so what they did is they hired curators. So curators were effectively editors, and their job was to provide editorial oversight of those trending articles. Now, those curators were contractors. So they worked for a third party contracted by Facebook. But they worked in Facebook's offices, literally in the basement of their New York offices. And um, what they heard a lot was that you know, they weren't supposed to publicly say they were working for Facebook. Um, that Facebook wanted to keep the magic about how trending topics worked a secret. But they started working on trending topics. And for a couple of years, they were working away at trying to improve you know, what was showing up in that feed and making sure it was contextualized, writing little summaries of these pieces. They were often people who may be kind of similar to you, right? Like they finished a journalism program. They were in their 20s. This was one of their first jobs. And so they were writing these little tidbits for Facebook, and it seemed like a pretty good gig. Well, so in 2016, um, Facebook was accused of those people being biased. A lot of them came from like elite liberal arts colleges, and the accusation was that they were all liberal and that they didn't have enough conservative viewpoint and they were suppressing conservative sources. Facebook did an internal investigation into this, did not find evidence of bias, but nevertheless, they decided to fire all of these curators. So they fired these curators, and um, pretty much immediately after this happened, um, fake news started coming to the surface because there was no human there to prevent it. So within three days, we had this story um, about Megyn Kelly. It is not true, uh, saying she backed Hillary. And the story was also like, poorly written, riddled with typos. And that showed up in the trending feed, and it stayed there for hours. Uh, we also had things like you know, the Pope endorsing Donald Trump also didn't happen, and many, many more. In fact, um, BuzzFeed did an analysis of this, and they looked at the top, fa uh, top fake election stories and then the top mainstream election stories. And in fact, they found that the engagement on those stories is actually higher for the fake news stories. So you have this one um, you know, about Pope Francis shocking the world by endorsing Donald Trump, 960,000 views or shares. And then that's from Ending the Fed, which was actually from a uh, Eastern European teenager's basement, um, where he would copy and paste fake news from other sites. Versus only uh, 849,000 was the most, that was the most shared story um, that was actually true. And that was true for a lot of those different stories. Like the fake news stories were routinely shared more often than the others. So right after this happened, Mark Zuckerberg said like, we didn't do anything though. He was like, well, it's a really small amount. And you know, the idea that we might have influenced the election is a pretty crazy idea. Well, if you fast forward to this year, turns out Facebook now estimates that 10 million people in the US saw their Russian-backed ads. And in fact, that's Facebook's estimation. There are other independent scholars working on this who think that the actual number is a lot higher. Facebook is now under all of this federal investigation for the role that it might have played in the election and how it let all of this stuff slide by. And what happened with the ads is not that dissimilar from what happened with fake news. So the fake news side, they fired the curators. They said, we'll just let the algorithm do it. They didn't let the curators talk to the people who designed the algorithm. So the entire time those curators were working, they were never allowed to talk to the engineers. So they were never able to tell them how to make the algorithm better. Once they were fired, there was no filter. On the ad side, you have automated ad approval software. 
Not a lot of humans involved in reviewing what's coming up. Same thing starts to happen. Stuff slips by and there's nobody there to catch it. Facebook is making a lot of money. It earned almost $27 billion off of its ads last year. It is worth half a trillion dollars. That's its market cap right now, half a trillion. So Facebook has taken like a huge percentage of money that used to go to media companies. Media companies that do journalism, which are bound by ethics, which have actual regulations, they have policies, they have systems. Facebook doesn't have any of that because what Facebook thinks of itself as is absolutely not as a media company. They're just a platform. They earned 57% more off of their ads in 2016 as in 2015. It's very profitable to allow all this stuff to slip by. And that's why Facebook doesn't really bother to do anything else. It doesn't want to have to. Because they can make an absolute boatload of money not doing it, right? Like, because there's nobody there to stop them. If they were a newspaper, somebody would be like, whoa, 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 you can't do that. I mean, they had a whole issue where they were letting you um, buy housing ads where you could target people by race. That's illegal. Like, the Federal Fair Housing ha Act makes that illegal. And if a newspaper took on a housing ad that way, they would be in big trouble. And Facebook was like, oh, oh, oops. This happens over and over because of the underlying values and principles that are guiding these companies. Back in 2012, when Facebook went public, um, he wrote a letter to potential investors, Mark Zuckerberg did. And it says, you know, as most companies grow, they slow down. They start getting worried. They're afraid of making mistakes. Uh, they're more afraid of making mistakes than of losing opportunities by moving too slowly. So we have a saying, move fast and break things. The idea is that if you never break anything, you're probably not moving fast enough. Officially, this is no longer the slogan at Facebook. Officially, they don't say this anymore. In the way that the company operates, though, this is very much what happens. Let's get something out the door. Let's focus. Let's put our blinders on. And it comes back to that same narrow vision that we talked about earlier, right? A narrow vision about the people who are going to use its products and a really narrow vision about the priorities that it should be designing for. And so much of this comes down to this one word, the most hated word. Facebook's only priority has been maximizing how much money it can make, which means maximizing how long you spend there, how many friends you have, how many times your friends check on the things you say. All of those page views result in more ad dollars, makes them more desirable for advertising. Nobody wants to surface tragic reminders or rape threats or sell fake news. Nobody wants to do all of these negative things at Facebook. But that's what happens. That's what happens when you've hyper-focused on this one thing without ever reining in your goals for engagement. When ad dollars always win, what it does is it results in a system that's really breakable or really hackable, really easy to be misused, really easy to be exploited. So again, I'm, thought, I'm thinking back to this quote from Zeynep Tefeki. These are people who want to be in the tech business and they are in the people business, and they are in over their heads. And this is really important to be thinking about now because tech is, is touching basically every aspect of our lives. I've only touched on a few of them today. And it's trying to touch so many more. Just last week, Facebook says that it wants to combat revenge porn. A laudable goal. Revenge porn is when somebody takes you know, nude photos of an ex, usually, or similar, and posts them online to get back at them. It's awful. It's abusive. So what Facebook wants to do is to have you send your nudes to them in advance so that they can put like a digital thumbprint on them and say, oh, OK, we're going to protect those from being spread. So this is a pilot in Australia. Here's how it works. You complete an online form with the government in Australia. The government then um, sends that form to Facebook. Meanwhile, you're supposed to go to your Facebook Messenger account and send yourself the nude photos. So then a special team at Facebook retrieves your nudes, reviews them, and they create this numerical fingerprint. It's called a hash. Um, and Facebook stores that hash. So what it says is if we don't store the photo, we're going to take this numerical fingerprint of the photo and store that. And then it tells you once it's done that. And then it says, OK, you can delete the photo from your messenger. So then now you're supposed to go back to your messenger account, and you're going to delete your photo. 
And then once you've done that, Facebook says it will delete your photo from its servers. Then when somebody uploads photos in the future, they all get checked against that database of hashes. And so if it comes up as being like, oh, this has already been flagged as a piece of potential revenge porn, then it's, it's going to be prevented from being posted. Seems fine. I'm gonna, no, like, I don't think Facebook has really shown us that they're ready for this kind of responsibility. And in fact, what I think that they've done is they've sort of like built this very technical solution, right? Where it's like, we can take your photo, we can turn it into a hash, and then once it's in a hash, we can search that against a database, and it's gonna be great. But that process I just described, that process is a mess. That process has like 75 ways along the line that it could break. And it also has all of these potential ethical problems, right? Because you have actual people at Facebook who are supposed to be responsible for reviewing your nude photos. And then you're supposed to delete them from your messenger and they say they're gonna delete them from their servers. I mean, like, do you really trust Facebook to get this right? If Facebook can't stop sending people like peppy ads for Instagram that show rape threats on them, do you think that they can get this right? And I think it really comes down to an industry that has treated all of these things like bug fixes. So when we talk about software bugs, this is like kind of common industry speak, right? Like, oh, I click this thing and the thing doesn't work right. I click the button and nothing pops up. Oh, it's a bug, we'll fix the bug, we move on. But it treats its ethical failures in the same way. Oh, we have this problem with Siri during like suicidal issues, like, oh, we'll fix it, we move on. Oh, we surface this tragic thing for this year in review, oh, we're so sorry, we won't do that again. But then it makes the same problems happen again and again. And so what we need to think about in tech, just like in all media, is we need to think about what are the systemic patterns we're looking at? And what are the systemic actions that we need to take to change that? And that is why I was so mad when I read the Google memo this summer. I don't know how many of you saw that, but it was this 10-page memo written by an engineer at Google. And what he did in this memo was he argued that um, Google needed to basically stop all of its diversity programs because the reason that there were not more women in technology was that women are just scientifically less suited for it. And then he cited a bunch of studies that were very tenuous at best um, that showed like tiny differences between gender and extrapolated out that like, therefore women just don't like to do technology. And so in that letter, he wrote also what he wanted Google to do about it. And he said that Google needed to do things like de-emphasize empathy. That was one of his recommendations to Google. As a company, you should make empathy less important because being emotionally unengaged helps us better reason about the facts. That is precisely the wrong answer. The problem in technology is not that we're not spending the time reasoning about the facts. The problem is that we have immersed ourselves in some messy human issues, and so we need to get, if anything, better at empathy, better at understanding the emotional impact of the work, better at understanding history and context. Because otherwise, we don't have anybody's job that's deciding what it means to be fair. Like, that's not been a job in tech. Or, what does it mean to look at history. What, how, do we, how do we interpret sort of the historical context of this decision that we're making? Particularly issues like race and gender, historical context really matters. Or just whose job is it to think about how this could go wrong? Like whose job is it to look at a potential feature, to look at a, a discussion about like, ooh, wouldn't it be cool if, and to say, what are the ways that that could fail? What are the ways that could be misused? That's somebody's job when it's security related. So like, when it's like, oh, how could somebody hack this system? Somebody has that job. They're gonna think about those threats. But it's nobody's job to think about those human threats. And so when I look at the tech industry today and I look at the way in which it's so intertwined with our lives and so intertwined with everything else, we have to remember what tech is, isn't is just technology. It's not just tech. As much as the tech industry would like you to think of it as a special shiny thing, it is media. So much of what Facebook is doing is absolutely media. Media companies have standards, ethics, history, rules. And it's not just media, that's why it's messy. If it was just like a media company, it would be one thing. But in a lot of ways, tech has become kind of infrastructure, right? You look at the role that like Google and Facebook have in the world, Facebook has two billion users. Um, they're infrastructural to the way that a lot of our society works. And Ultimately, the tech that we engage with is really deeply embedded with culture. 
And so we need to be thinking about it in all of these different contexts, and we need to be bringing in a lot more than just the folks who come from the technical side. One of the big things that I talk a lot about is the way that folks from different backgrounds, and particularly the kinds of stuff that you all are studying, need to be much more involved in the tech industry and have a lot more power over the kinds of decisions that are being made. Because if we leave it to people whose only training has been in computer science, then we're going to continue seeing more and more problems like these, and in fact, the problems are just gonna get worse. So that's all I have for you this morning. Um, I think we have a couple minutes left for questions. Thank you.